Ladies and gentlemen, there is a joke that only two people in the whole world understand the price of gold. They both work for the Bank of England, but unfortunately, they both disagree. Now, I've written a couple of thousand of pages about gold in the last couple of years. I'm doing this brick of a report for 13 years now. Um, we wrote about inflation, about our monetary system, about mining stocks, and I don't claim that I really understand gold. Sometimes I'm making some good calls, sometimes not. But what fascinates me every day in my job is actually the amount of information that gold discounts and the immense history of gold. Actually, gold in every religion is something special. You can go to a mosque, you can go to a church, you can go to a temple. On every continent, gold is something special. So actually, therefore, I thought I'll bring something that is quite old. This is a coin called a Solidus. It is 1,500 years old, and as the name says, that was basically the salary for Roman soldiers in the Western Roman Empire. So, solidus, that's also the root for the word solid, but also for soldier. And my report is called In Gold We Trust, and I really do trust you, so we'll hand it around, and you can have a look at it. But we've got two securities guys, bigger than Jochen, waiting outside, yeah? <laughs> so, it's a beautiful coin and it's 1,500 years old, as I said. So, as I've said, it, gold is a fantastic topic. It is something that, that really excites me every day. And therefore, you know, we hear quite a lot about sustainability and Mrs. Thunberg seems to be really the most important person nowadays. But actually nobody is really talking about the sustainability of our monetary system. Nobody talks about the sustainability of central bank policy. Nobody is talking about the debt situation. I've got three small kids and I think it's not really sustainable to hand over such huge piles of debt to the next generation. So actually, we want to make a little difference with our In Gold We Trust report. We put it out every year. We want to inform and educate people about sound money. And actually, it is available for free. It is available in German, in English, and now also in Mandarin. So I invite you to sign up. It's totally for free. And in the next couple of minutes, and that's the very good news, it's not going to be one hour, as the program said, it's going to be 30 minutes, because we all had a long day. So I will be talking about the seventh sense of financial markets. Now, Jochen already said what the five senses are. The sixth sense is extrasensory perception. In German, we would say Körpersinn. And the seventh sense, is something like gut feeling, like intuition, intuition about the future. And from my point of view, the price of gold is discounting quite a lot of information. And actually, the breakout that we have seen a couple of months ago is a strong sign for a macro shift in financial markets. And this will be the main topic of my speech. But let me start with something different. Do you remember the horrible tsunami of 2004? First the earth shook, then came the flood. The underwater earthquake that occurred off the coast of Sumatra in December 2004 was not only the third strongest quake ever, it also unleashed a powerful and deadly tsunami. And actually, Actually, there's an old song in Indonesia. When animals go crazy, run away from the sea and go to the highlands. And just a couple of hours before the tsunami, 
all animals started to behave differently. Elephants in Sri Lanka, for example, felt the threat long before and fled inland. People who instinctively followed those animals were saved and didn't have to die. And it's not only elephants, it's also snakes that awaken from hibernation. It is, for example, goats that often kind of feel and sense earthquake or volcanic eruptions. But unfortunately, in our modern technology-based society, these animal skills have lost their importance, and this warning signal went unheeded. But nowadays, and this is very, very interesting from my point of view, actually there's technology, science, using the seventh sense of animals. This is a program called ICARUS, which stands for International Cooperation for Animal Research Using Space. And it's an observation system for animal movements, and it went live in July 2014. So what do they actually do? They put small signals, small transmitters, on animals, like those goats, for example, but also on elephants, even on little uh, insects, on, on bees, and on birds. So the researchers from the Max Planck Institute, they actually want to use this seventh sense of animals to forecast natural disaster and to avoid the consequences of those natural disasters. And the beauty of it is, it works. So actually, um, a couple of weeks ago, those researchers were able to predict a volcanic eruption at the Mount Etna. It wasn't a big one, but they perfectly called it a couple of hours ago, uh, before. So this is also the reason why insurance companies and reinsurance companies are getting interested in this seventh sense of animals. Now, why am I talking about this project? Actually, it seems that many of us, many market participants, many people that you know, follow what's going on in the big picture, they kind of intuitively and with their gut feeling, they sense, well, that cannot be right. This is pretty dangerous. But actually, we kind of ignore it and we overrule our gut feeling with our minds. So perhaps it would be good if we should not ignore the signals that gold as the seventh sense of financial markets is telling us. And what are those signals? Well, actually, we've seen this huge basing pattern. We've seen this correction. It was a pretty tough couple of years for all of us. And there was a massive resistance zone. Actually, I said at um, the spring conference, the Denver Gold in spring, I think early April, I said, ladies and gentlemen, we are already in a bull market in gold just not in dollar terms. Gold is trading in the bull market in most currencies, but everybody is just staring at the dollar price of gold. And we wrote in the last report that once we're above that massive resistance zone, this is gonna be the first leg, the first stage of a new bull market, and momentum will kick in. And what I said before, that gold was trading already in a bull market, in most currencies, this is what you can see here. That's a so-called world gold price. So gold not priced in dollar terms, but in a currency basket. And you can see that actually starting already in 2014, the price of gold made higher lows. And actually the price of gold, the world gold price of gold is trading at an all-time high at the moment. So often people are a bit frustrated with the price of gold nowadays. I wonder why. Um, I think they only care about the dollar price. But for many producers, for example, in Canada, in Australia, it is a fantastic price of gold that we're seeing at the moment. But now, 
gold is also trading in a bull market in dollar terms, and that's a very strong sign. What you can see here is lots of numbers. Actually, green are positive years, red are negative years, obviously. And actually, you can see that since the beginning of the year, in euro terms, gold is up 20%. In US dollar terms, gold is up 14%. Many people today at the conference, but also uh, last weekend in Munich at the Edelmetall Messe, they said, wow, oh, I'm so frustrated with gold. It's now down 50 bucks. And I said, come on, don't get greedy. Gold is up double digits in basically every currency. That's a pretty decent performance. On average, gold is up 16.2% in those currencies. So I would say that's quite a good and stellar performance for this year. And on average, over those years, since 2001, gold is up, for example, 10% on an annual basis in dollar terms or 9.6% in euro terms. So I would say pretty good performance, but still people kind of want more, it seems. And we've seen some macro shifts happening, as I've said before. For, for us, in our fund, actually the Australian dollar, but also the Canadian dollar are very, very important because they're pretty reliable inflation indicators. So what you can see is an enormous bear market in the Canadian dollar, but also in the Australian dollar since 2012, basically a big bull market in the dollar, in the US dollar. But now it seems that this is at least kind of stabilizing. It's not a big bull market in Aussie dollars or Canadian dollars, but it is stabilizing. And the last couple of weeks were pretty positive. So I think this is something that should be followed as a signal. And also, commodity markets are actually doing quite okay. Here again, big bear market, which was also the bull market, of course, in the US dollar. But actually, the Bloomberg Commodities Index, well, that's not the roaring bull market yet, but at least it's stabilizing and it's putting in higher lows. Copper, looking actually pretty well. Have a look at the Commitment of Traders report of Copper. It's fantastic. So from my point of view, um, normally it's first the gold space, then silver follows, and then the whole commodity space follows. We've done some studies on that, and this is a very, very um, accurate um, uh, uh, time series that we, are, that we are seeing. Gold against the S&P 500. We all know that equities did extremely well the last couple of years. Actually, on a relative basis, equities were the place to be compared to gold. So we've seen relative weakness of the stock market, uh, of the gold market against the stock market. Now, this is also stabilizing. The fourth quarter, 2018, ladies and gentlemen, you might remember that it was a horrible quarter for most asset classes. But gold was up 7% and mining stocks were up 14%. Fourth quarter 2018 was the quarter when gold and in general the mining space reappeared on the radar screens of many institutional players, of many wealth managers, because they saw, okay, gold actually did its job brilliantly to stabilize the portfolio and actually to equalize the losses from our other asset classes. Now, what are the main, rain, the main risk factors? From my point of view, it is inflation risks and recession risks. And gold might be sniffing out that somebody, something is kind of cooking at the moment. Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund uh, uh, in the world, he said the two main risk factors for the average portfolio are less than expected growth and more than expected inflation. Now Bridgewater at the moment is buying huge amounts of physical gold and they're storing everything outside of the banking system. It's quite a sign, I would say. And you can see here on this chart that actually fourth quarter 2018, I already mentioned it, was the first quarter when central banks after 10 years of a liquidity party tried to reduce 
the liquidity. They actively reduced, for the first time in 10 years, central bank liquidity. We've seen quantitative tightening. We have seen that most central banks tried to remove the safety net. They removed the punch ball from the markets. And I told you what happened in fourth quarter 2018. Actually, December was the worst month for the US stock market since the Great Depression in the 1930s. So they were quite quick to reverse again and make this big monetary U-turn. And now they are becoming much more dovish again. So what should we expect, first of all, from the Federal Reserve? The Fed was, all, uh, was talking about the return to zero rates at the last meeting. Janet Yellen, somebody said she looks a bit like the grandmother of Harry Potter. Um, Yellen says the Fed might turn to QE in another downturn. The Wall Street Journal is quoting a study by the Federal Reserve New York saying negative rates would have sped up the economic recovery. So actually they calculated it and said in 2008, actually we should have implemented negative rates. That would have been perfect for our economy. Now, why is that important? It's not a coincidence that um, those papers are coming out now at the moment. They want to prepare market participants that actually in the course of a crisis, of a recession, whatever, they will implement such measures. Jay Powell just recently said, he offered one specific strategy, make up inflation. So when a central bank undershoots its inflation target, it can promise to the public that will overshoot in the future. As it makes up for lost inflation, the bank would be also making up for lost growth. So the Federal Reserve might consider higher inflation targets, of course, only temporarily. But this is something that is actively discussed at the moment. And the bulls on Wall Street, of course, they want more and more. And they got hungry. And now everybody is hoping for at least two rate cuts next year. We've seen three, one, three rate cuts this year. But from my point of view, they will need more. I think the US will go to zero or perhaps at some point even to negative rates. What's going on in the Eurozone? Mr. Draghi delves into policy toolbox to bolster growth. That was quoted in the Financial Times just recently. The outgoing ECB president announced that when his successor, Christine Lagarde, takes office, she will oversee a strategic review. I've said that already today. Normally, if you work in a big company and your boss tells you, well, we have to do a strategic review. That's normally not something positive. Yeah? It's, it's like we have to find synergies. Yeah? That's not a good sign. Um, and this would have the scope to examine even more radical ideas, including the possibility of changing its inflation target, and even the idea of the central bank paying money directly into individuals' bank accounts. So. This is not a rumor in some gold bug block. This is actually in the FT based on the discussions of the European Central Bank. So this is helicopter money, QE for the people, uh, you name it. This is going to happen. And Christine Lagarde. <laughs> Somebody says she sometimes seems to fall asleep in a tanning bed. Um, of course, she's a highly political decision. It's, not, it's no coincidence that not Jens Weidmann, who stands for the more German Bundesbank type of central banking, that he didn't get uh, chosen, but that Christine Lagarde was chosen and her job basically at the IMF was bailing out bankrupt banana republics. So uh, from my point of view, it's a strong sign that she got chosen. And she will also promise to paint the ECB green. Um, 
I've read it up and, and I was confirmed. Actually, there's only one mandate of the European Central Bank and it's price stability. Um, it's not really solving climate change problems, but actually this is something that the ECB wants to do now. And if you should have some time and if you want to anticipate what might happen, have a look at the testimony of Christine Lagarde in front of the European Parliament. She's very open about it. She's talking about euro bonds, she's talking about helicopter money, she's talking about negative rates and, of course, in combination with capital controls. So, what's the biggest pain trade for markets at the moment? Ladies and gentlemen, you know that in the bond market, there's quite a party going on, I would say. Yeah? Sometimes it's perhaps time to leave the party a bit earlier. And the last couple of months were pretty wild, I would say. So at the moment, um, the, the amount of negative yielding bonds is at 13 trillion. 13 trillion, just to give you a perspective, that's the combined um, GDP of Japan, Germany, India and the UK. So it's, it's quite a lot of money. So what's the biggest pain trade for those negative yielding bonds? It is rising inflation. And you might remember, my friends, uh, some of you have seen me speaking already and for some reason are here again. I've got some friends and uh, you might remember them. There are some points in life when you should perhaps step back and say, it's not a good idea what I'm actually doing. <laughs> Let's reconsider it. And I've had this idea or this picture uh, when I went ra running at a conference and I had really amazing talks with colleagues managing uh, huge funds and they all said, you know, it's all so overvalued. It's really expensive, but you know, we will get out before the market crashes. And I said, sounds good in theory. In practice, I'm not sure if it works. And there are more examples of moments in life <laughs> when you should kind of reconsider <laughs> what you're doing. That hurts, especially for the man. <laughs> the winner of the Darwin Awards 2014. Um, also good. Yeah, <laughs> we've all been young. And, and this is my favorite, it's, it's kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. What I wanted to tell you is, if you should consider buying negative yielding bonds at the moment, take a step back and reconsider it. Perhaps inflation might be on the horizon sooner or later. And actually, inflation is quite a contrarian topic at the moment. Bloomberg Business Week just came out a couple of months ago and said, is inflation dead? And they're writing about the, the inflation monster that was killed and deflation being the big concern. And a couple of days ago, The Economist came out with a big special report, the end of inflation. So it seems that nobody really cares about inflation. Yeah, If it's on the headlines, if it's on the covers of those magazines, it seems, okay, that might be some sort of a crowded trade. And actually, our incrementum inflation signal, which helps us with our positioning. It helps us when to play offense and when to play defense. And we've been playing defense in our fund for quite a while. It went to a full inflation signal a couple of weeks ago. So we're playing offense now and we've got the highest allocation in mining equities, in commodities and in commodity currencies that we ever had in the fund in the last five years. So inflation might be one thing and People always, that's probably the moment when the ladies wake up um, and all the guys are getting a bit, ah. <laughs> 
Actually, people always tell me there is no inflation. And I was on a panel with a lady from the ECB, and she said, ah, there's, there's not enough inflation. You really have to get mo become more aggressive. And I said, there's lots of inflation, actually. Yeah? It's just you're measuring it differently. From my point of view, we're seeing massive asset price inflation. Yeah? Just have a look at real estate prices all over the globe. Have a look at equity markets. Have a look at bond markets trading at all-time highs. Have a look at the art market, fine wine, you name it. And also for football players, 10 years ago, you could buy Cristiano Ronaldo. You don't have to like him, but he's a great football player. You could get him for 19 mil 90 million. What can you get for 90 million euro at the moment? <laughs> Harry Maguire. You get Harry Maguire for 90 million. He's a decent defender. He came from Leicester to Manchester United. He's really, he's probably a nice guy, but <laughs> 90 million. And that shows you that inflation might also be in the sports market. So, the second threat that I'm seeing is recession risks. Of course, central bankers, don't really forecast recessions that well. But actually, the models by the Federal Reserve out of New York, they are pretty accurate. And they've got one inflation indicator that is based on the yield curve, and it tells you the recession risk in the next 12 months is actually 40%. That's pretty high. But on Wall Street at the moment, this is one of my very favorite charts, um, so we basically show uh, or we analyze um, the forecasts of the 89 analysts, economists that are questioned by Bloomberg. So those are really the big guys um, running very, very sophisticated models. 89 economists, what would you say? How many out of them do see a recession until the year 2021? Zero. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So out of those 89 economists, nobody is seeing a recession in the next two and a half years. How many saw a recession in 2007? Zero. Zero. Very good. So I don't say that a recession has to be around the corner, but actually the market is not really discounting it. And once we should come into a recession, once the recession clouds should get darker, it will have massive consequences for positioning in financial markets. And actually, gold works pretty well in the course of recessions. On average, gold is up 20% in the last recessions since the 1970s. We analyzed that in our last In Gold We Trust report. We said in every recession, there are actually four different stages. And in three out of those stages, actually, gold is one of the best performing asset classes. So if you think that a recession might be around the corner, gold is probably a pretty good hedge. Gold mining stocks. When I started analyzing mining stocks, I had full hair. Now, not really. It's been a bit frustrating the last couple of years, but I'm seeing many, many positive signs. And actually, the bear market really, really, really um, was positive for, 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 for the industry itself. Rick Rule said, for the first time in my lifetime, the gold mining industry has actually decided to become an industry rather than a floating abstraction. Now, I think at the moment we are seeing very, very interesting valuations. We are seeing that many companies wrote off, pro wrote off projects, got their costs under control, actually really care about shareholder value. So this creative destruction that happened in the gold market is definitely positive for investors. And it seems on a relative basis, the valuation, that's the Barron's Gold Mining Index, that's the gold index that is longest available actually since the, actually since the year 1950. So Mining stocks versus gold itself. And you can see, relative to gold, mining stocks have only been once cheaper. And it was only slightly cheaper at the beginning of 2016. Until then, 1950, 
mining stocks on a relative basis have never been cheaper. And it seems that there's, you know, kind of some relative strength happening. It is not a huge bull market yet, but it's also a sign that there is something changing in the industry. You can see that the Barron's Gold Mining Index versus gold is putting in some relative strength. We are following those ratios that show us the strength of a bull market quite a lot. So that's pretty uh, positive. And this chart is one of my favorite charts. You can see the bull markets again in the Barron's Gold Mining Index since the year 1942. So every bull market normally ends in euphoria. It's that stage where actually stocks double and triple within only a couple of weeks. Now we should not forget that the last bear market in mining equities was the longest and the most severe in history. We were down 85% from the top. So normally a bull market is the mirror image of a bear market and the other way around. So this bull market in the mining space has hardly begun and we're like average in terms of the length and in terms of the performance, it's way under average. So we're far away from that euphoria stage. It's very, very convincing from my point of view. So the big question is, where will we go? As I've said, I do not claim myself uh, to understand the gold price fully, but um, I think I've got some, some thoughts regarding relative valuation. The commodity space is probably even more hated than the gold space. And you can see here again on a relative basis, commodities versus the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, uh, Index. So that's pretty, pretty cheap. We're at the same valuation levels like mid-1960s. And before that, commodities have never been that undervalued relative to the stock market. So if you think that inflation might become a concern, if you think that the dollar is in the process of rolling over like we do at the moment, then perhaps a small allocation at least in the commodity space might be a good idea. So we're already coming to our final slide. The monetary U-turn has begun, ladies and gentlemen. I think it would, naive, would be naive to think that central banks will not act very aggressively. It's all on the table. There will be more quantitative easing. Actually, the Federal Reserve raised their balance sheets by 220 billion the last seven weeks. Of course, they don't call it quantitative easing, but they did it. Um, but expect more direct measures like helicopter money, like MMT, like QE for the people. Actually, this is something that is really becoming mainstream. And what would you think if people get 1,500 euros, francs, whatever, every month on their account? What would they do? Some of them would probably be wise and buy some gold. Some would save it. Some would pay down debt. But most people would start consuming, would spend it, yeah? Um, so it will have very, very direct consequences for the economy. It might be some sort of an uh, artificial boom, but the consequences for inflation will be much more direct than with traditional quantitative easing. Fiscal stimulus will gain in significance. Expect all sorts of new deals, Green New Deal, healthcare, whatever. There will be fiscal stimulus, and I think Christine Lagarde was really tough on the Germans, those Germans always saving money and uh, don't, not running any deficits. So there will be much more infrastructure investments. And, you know, I think it's, it's a pretty good idea, especially in Germany, uh, and it would, would, would change some, some, some things for the, for the better, probably, because if you know German infrastructure, it's quite disappointing sometimes. But it will also have a very direct consequence for inflation numbers. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Leonardo da Vinci said that, and gold is a simple 
reliable and effective means to hedge against inflation, equity risks, and recession risk. We crunched the numbers on that, and actually, if you want to hedge for something, gold is a very, very good hedge against those three risks. Mining stocks are in the beginning of a new bull market. We have seen some creative destruction. And from my point of view, leverage on a rising gold price is higher than ever. And at some point, and it might already be starting, generalists will come into the market. And this might be a game changer. And gold has entered a new bull market. There will be some corrections. We are in a correction, and I think this can last for a couple of more weeks, even months. But I think within this cycle, we're seeing only a few hundred dollars of, ups, of downside if there should be really some sort of a liquidity crunch, like in 2008, and a few thousand dollars of upside. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed it. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I think there's still some time for Q&A. Thank you very much.